Now, welcome back to Think Tech. This is Keeping the World Company, and we're talking about Turkey today. And uh, we're talking about uh, Recep Tayyip uh, Erdogan, and Turkey is spelled T-U-R-K-I-Y-E, right? Okay, and we're going to talk about that with, uh, with Tim Apicella and Chuck Crumpton. We're going to try to find out, A, what's going on in Turkey, and how that affects Russia and the EU, and how it affects the United States. Because, um, you know, these days we live in a flat world. Thank you for being here. Let's talk about Turkey. Tim, what about Erdogan? Can you give us a, like a précis about who he is, where he came from, what's the deal? I can't tell you much about where he came from other than the country that we're discussing, but I can tell you that, like uh, many aut autocrats, he has uh, the desire to be in control, um, not necessarily welcoming democratic principles, uh, particularly on how the government is run. Uh, like dictators or uh, would-be dictators, has a high sense of insecurity and paranoia. Um, he is still tracking down those that he perceives as responsible for a would-be coup attempt uh, many years ago. Um, that that um, earnest of tracking the, the guilty down or the would-be guilty has led for him to not allow Sweden to become part of one of the NATO members. He's accusing Sweden of being um, harboring uh, Kurds that uh, were involved or could could potentially have knowledge about the, uh, the coup attempt in Turkey. And um, he has done basically very oppressive uh, tactics against people of his own society, um, journalists, uh, people that would speak out, uh, critics, um, certainly anyone of the LGBTQ uh, population. He's really clamped down on them. And then to top it off, he has some really bizarre ideas about how to run an economy. Uh, right now, Turkey, I believe, is sitting around 40% inflation rate, uh, thanks, thankfully to, due to uh, an artificial reduction of interest rates. And, and you can't just artificially lower rates because you want success during your, your term. Uh, that leads to bad things, and that bad thing is inflation. We'll talk about the election in a minute, Chuck, but let's, let's talk about the autocracy thing here. The purge that he had a few years ago, that was well before the election. And he was brutal about that. And a lot of people lost their jobs. And a lot of people had to leave the country of Turkey. You know? If you try to cast uh, Turkey as a Western country, sometimes you have a problem with that. Remember, it straddles both sides. You know, it has West and East and the Bosphorus and the one bridge, and, you know, divides the country and maybe the world, you know, that that's where the uh, Silk Road went right there. And so um, you have to see him as a guy who is straddling many sides, okay? But he, at the end of the day, he's an autocrat. He likes purges. He hates the Kurds, and he hates the Syrians now. Um, and take all that of two decades of power, and, and you begin to wonder what, what side of the Bosphorus is Turkey really on? And how much an autocrat is he? Well, Erdogan is beginning his third decade in power. He was prime minister from 2003. He became president in 2014. He's now won his third five-year term. Should be his last, as I understand, under Turkish law. Also, his health is not that great. Uh, so there are people and machinations in work to uh, prepare to replace him, potentially before that five-year term is up. But he's got a lot to deal with. And so power is essential. And the conservative faction that backs him agrees with that because he's been using the power consistently with their preferences against Kurds, for Islamists, <laughs> squashing down opponents. The guy most likely to beat him in this election wound up with a two-year prison term, thanks to his influence over the courts in Turkey. So it's it's a long way and moving farther away from anything approaching democratic features and toward autocratic. The perception of his support group is he needs that power in order to be effective. And again, it's kind of like the MAGA Republicans here. It's, it's an enemies, us versus them approach to governance rather than a bipartisan, collaborative, consensus-building approach to government. And that's what autocrats do. Mm. And they have scapegoats. 
uh, like the Kurds, like the Syrians. Um, and, you know, it, it creates a hate and divisiveness, and then you you use that in order to achieve power. One of, one of the interesting elements, uh, by the way, um, about hate in Turkey is, is the, um, the Armenians, you know, the Armenian genocide of 1915. And um, going way back, the Turkish government um, decided to do a propaganda campaign. Um, and there's a movie about this, you know, called uh, Intent to Destroy. It just came out. We reviewed it earlier this week. The Turkish government uh, decided that it was going to deny the genocide uh, in Turkey of the Armenians. Now, 1.5 million Armenians were killed brutally, intentionally. They vulnerable. They had no defense. Um, and and the, um, the propaganda was that uh, they were killed because they were real troublemakers. Really? A small child? Troublemaker? Yeah? And, and, and the women and the, and the old people, they're troublemakers. Is that why you killed them? Anyway, 1.5. And what troubles me about Erdogan is that he continues the propaganda on that. That is to deny the genocide of the Armenians. It's really extraordinary. Um, and it helps him, I guess, or he thinks it helps him as an autocrat um, to you know, have these continuing positions that, that enunciate hate. Um, and so anyway, going into it, he was kind of weak, Tim, wasn't he? He had, he had some trouble. Uh, the, the, the vote that was taken last weekend was a runoff. Can you give us a, a thumbnail of what happened? What was his weakness and why did he not achieve? Um, why did he not prevail in the original vote? Why did he have to go to a runoff? Yeah, I, I think uh, you can attribute that to existing criticism of his form of government oppressive form of government. But I think recently you had to examine how all these buildings collapsed during their earthquake. And clearly a, clearly there was um, shortcuts around uh, permits, um, inspections of permits once the work was done, that structural integrity was not maintained when these buildings were put together. And that is a reflection on his government. Um, again, the buck stops with him. And when you are accepting perhaps bribes to uh, short circuit uh, proper structural inspections and things are getting built without proper uh, plan review, um, you have what you have in Turkey and buildings that should have been able to stand did not. And as a result, thousands and thousands of people were killed. And I don't think that really sits well for the popularity of any leader that um, this kind of thing happens under their their uh, their leadership. Are you suggesting corruption? Oh, absolutely. So, um, you know, one very interesting article, Chuck, uh, that, that appeared in the Times was the people who voted for him seemed to be on the religious side. As I mentioned, you know, Turkey is like divided. Uh, on the west side of the Bosphorus, it's like European. And on the east side, it's like Middle Eastern. Uh, and the Middle Eastern means Muslim. Um, and the article in the Times said, uh, thank goodness for the women, because he had courted the women um, and he got the women to vote for him. But the, but the footnote to that is the women who voted for him were Muslim. Uh, they were on the east side, so to speak, and they were in great number because he had been courting them. He used his power. Uh, he used the propaganda machine um, to achieve success in the runoff election. Um, after all, you know, uh, an autocrat can always mm, get the votes if he plays it right. And uh, so I think that's what happened here. Do you have any sense of who voted for him and why they voted for him and why he prevailed? And then, of course, why he jailed his adversary? Well, it all fits together. I mean, the, the puzzle pieces form a pattern. And you've raised a really good point. Uh, Turkish scholars at least independent ones, have indicated that Erdogan has for some time controlled over 90% of the media. If the only information getting out, particularly to rural areas, which have been subjected to the, exactly the same things that Tim talks about, the earthquakes, the building collapses because of shoddy construction and the failure to institute and implement standards, all of those things, if they don't know there's a choice, then the only choice left to them 
is the one that the media says is the only way to save Turkey. It's kind of like the uh, Trump line, I'm, I'm your savior, put me in power and I will set everything right. And I'm the only one that can do it. The streets, I, I want to tell you a story about the streets. <clears throat> uh, 10 years ago, I was in Turkey. I was a tourist. And uh, one day there was um, a protest. And uh, it was a very peaceful protest in Taksim Park, which was two or three blocks away from my hotel. Uh, and in Taksim Park, they were protesting with the women and the children and the balloons and the baby strollers, that kind of protest, right? That, um, that uh, Erdogan wanted to build a shopping center there, and they'd really rather have a park. It's that same autocratic thing, you know, I will decide and I will do it. And so they protested, and that's on day one. It was very peaceful with the balloons and everybody having a picnic. On day two, he had, he had his uh, police in there with scrunchies. On day three, he had his, you know, and each time he accelerated, it, so did the crowd. Um, day two, with the truncheons, more people showed up, not less. And the baby strollers were no longer there. And, you know, that now became more, much more serious. I was there. I was in Turkey when this happened. Okay. Day, day three, it was no longer truncheons. It was uh, tear gas. Day four, it was rubber bullets and so forth. And each day it accelerated because he was determined to squash the protest in the street. And, and I think, um, you know, we can learn how autocrats work from what happened there. At the end of the day, he beat them good and they left Paxson Park. And I don't know if it's a shopping center there, but I, 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 I doubt this park. In any event, um, you know, Tim, uh, Chuck mentioned the name Trump here. And I think it's, it's worth dwelling on that. There was an article also in one of the papers I read um, to say that um, this, this is reminiscent of Trump. Erdogan is reminiscent of Trump. And, and the point the article made was that he had a terrible record. He had a bad record with the economy. He had a bad record in, in civil and human rights. Um, you know, he had done so many things that were ineffectual um, and, um, you know, damaging to the country and the people. And yet he won. And, and the proposition is, you know, for an autocrat, it doesn't matter what your policies are. It doesn't matter if you have no policies, you can still win. That was the point of the article. Do you agree with that? Is there really a comparison between er uh, Erdogan and Trump? Well, it's not just Erdogan. I, you know, let's take two steps back and look at the, the characteristics of a would-be dictator. And they're all as you've described. But here's the thing. Um, they like to rub shoulders and elbows with other dictators. Uh, no doubt Trump had an influence on Erdogan, but more importantly, Erdogan had an influence on Trump. It's, you know, it's basically a, a cycle of um, autocrat uh, characteristics. And, you know, who did, who did Trump always praise? You know, Kim Jong-un, uh, Putin. I mean, every dictator that you can think of, they came up as words of praise and glory for Donald Trump. And, and that's just, you know why? Because there's so few dictators out there that they have to rely on one. Another. It's kind of like a club. It's like um, a fraternity club. And uh, by God, they belong in it. And uh, our former president still is a member. Yeah, very, very troublesome. Um, and uh, it, it seems so clear because, you know, um, uh, Erdogan gets along with Viktor Orban in Hungary, another autocrat, gets along with, I mean, he's really part of that club. You're absolutely right, Tim. Uh, he gets along with um, Vladimir Putin in Russia. Oh, by the way, which two countries are keeping Sweden from coming into NATO? Hungary and Turkey. Right. And, and why is that? Why is that on the, on the superficial level? And why is it in reality? Why? Mm -hmm. Because um, he is a... Um, vindictive personality. He believes that these people in, in Sweden um, are harboring their, their terroristic uh, tendencies, and he wants them turned over. Once they're turned over, they won't see the light of day the next day. They'll be shot or never to be seen again. Uh, and Sweden is doing everything they can not to be part of that, that murder. And this is what's holding up the passage of Sweden. I think the only leverage the United States has is that Turkey wants... Um, a bunch of F-16 fighter jets and parts for their aging fighter fleet. 
And that is the leverage the United States has. And most likely that will win the day to allow uh, Sweden, at least from the Turkey side, uh, authority to become part of NATO. Hungary is a different story. Yeah, it is. And, and um, you know, Erdogan says, oh, I, I, I'm opposing uh, Sweden's entry um, because uh, there's, there's, there's Kurds there and they're my enemy. And They're a hated en- enemy. Hated and not, enemy. And not only, not only during Erdogan's term, but as you suggested, we're going back to the early 1900s, the late 1800s. This is a, um, call it the Rwanda, you know, Hutus versus the Tutsis. I mean, they are as absolutely hated as a population than anywhere you could find in the world. What What is revealed, though, is that he makes the argument that Sweden should not be permitted because um, uh, Sweden is sheltering Kurds. But uh, Viktor Orban in Hungary, they don't give a rip about the Kurds. They got nothing to do with Kurds. Part of the fraternal club. It's the club. It's absolutely the club. So, you know, I'm, I mean, I'm troubled about this, and I wonder what the dynamic is. If Trump got back in office, uh, Erdogan would be a hero for him. So would uh, Vladimir Putin, by the way, just to add that. And um, so you have, you know, serious foreign policy issues around Erdogan and the United States. And uh, Chuck, uh, you know, what, what should the United States do? Should it, should it provide the um, military weapons or provide the F-16 parts? Uh, should it help Erdogan? It has encouraged Erdogan or tried to get Erdogan to not sidle up to uh, Russia. But I don't think that's worked at all. The United States has the opportunity um, to push on this, should it? I think you have to give the Biden administration credit for one thing that has been a strength of Joe Biden's for many, many years. He picked some pretty bright, knowledgeable David Halberstam, best and the brightest people, particularly in his foreign policy work. Maybe not so much in the domestic, but in foreign policy. And one of the things that's clear about Turkey is that their key economic relationship is actually with the EU. They need to try and play Russia off against EU and the US and the West to the extent possible, but they're very limited because EU is their primary trading partner and their economy is in serious trouble. They're not only at 44% now, they were over 85% last year, inflation rate. And artificially keeping the interest rates low any economist will tell you that ain't going to work. So there will be coming, and most of the experts are saying, inflation is going to continue to increase, unemployment is going to soar, and Turkey's economy is going to continue to take major, major hits. In fact, after Erdogan's election, the Turkish lira continued to go down against the U.S. dollar. So to the extent that Biden's team is putting its chips on and with the European team, that's a smart move. That in the end, whether it's Finland or even Sweden, the pretext stuff is going to have to fall away because the economic need for Turkey with the EU is too overwhelming. He can't put that at risk. Well, there was another article, Tim, um, about these problems that Chuck describes, the economic problems, the social problems, um, you know, the, the problems that took place on Erdogan's watch, including, uh, you know, the, the earthquake and um, the construction problems. Um, uh, are They're not gone. None of that is gone. And so he, he slid in on the runoff by a thin margin. But these problems are still there. Um, and the Times was, um, you know, speculating on, you know, what is the future of Erdogan the next time around? Is he going to be able to hang on to this, given, you know, the decline of the country, the possible decline of the country? Well, he would be the first autocrat to run a country into the ground. And I would say that, you know, he's trying to do the um, apply the lipstick on a pig approach for his economy. And and what is that? He's bringing in an, um, and he brought him in before the fi- a new finance minister. I think his name is Sidwan or Sidian. But um, he's an ex Wall Street guy. He worked for UBS and um, can't remember the bank he worked for in in London. But uh, he's a he's a Wall Street guy, and he has actually some fairly good principles to apply, which are in direct opposition 
to the artificial um, and to maintain artificial low interest rates. So he's being brought in again, but really it's just window dressing. And uh, he's a figurehead and uh, thinking that will buy time and, and maybe things will turn around, but it won't. So there it is. You, it's an autocrat's approach to try to fix a problem that he's not willing to fix. Well, what it suggests is he's going to continue to do these power things as autocrats do because he's losing power or he's worried about losing power. Well, it's all about the show and the propaganda. And unfortunately, this this guy has a lot of credibility, but he won't have much credibility much longer if he's just the window dressing uh, for the economy and um, trying to alleviate people, people's fears that the economy is getting worse because they've installed him as the finance minister. Yeah, there was a there was a piece about how he didn't listen to the finance minister at all anyway. Bring in the wet window dressing. Yeah. 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 Chuck? Well, he's got two other problems that are out of control. One, of course, is the earthquake destruction. I mean, over 50,000 people were killed. The estimated conservative estimate of the cost of reconstruction is about 4% of Turkey's entire GDP. With a failing economy, with inflation over 44%, and dependence on European and Western trading relations, how is he going to maintain that? In addition, they've got over 5 million refugees, most of them Syrian, but a lot of Afghan as well. That's out of control. He's going to have to construct transitions and residences. He's promising to construct hundreds of thousands of homes for the Syrians to incentivize them to move back to their country. Where's the funding and the support for this going to come? Sorry, Chuck, to interrupt, but I believe he is getting money from Russia. Some. Well, that, that, so that's a good uh, segue to Russia. Chuck, I wanted to ask you about you know the, the Russian relationship here. Why exactly does he support uh, Putin? Is it the club? Is that what it is? Or does he have some real economic interest in, in being close to Russia? And, and Russia, vis-a-vis -vis the United States, is really not in a position to help him that well. Um, but he seems to be siding with Russia in the Ukraine matter, which is the biggest issue in Europe. Why is he doing that? Well, I think we have to look back at his relations with the EU. <clears throat> Because economically, the EU is in a very dominant leverage position. Politically, which is the only cards that Erdogan has to play, his only leverage back is to try and play Russia off against the EU and the US and to attempt to build relations with Putin and with Russia that will provide him at least some level of alternative, some threat of a plan B in dealing with the EU. Otherwise, he has no leverage at all. We had an Israeli on the show years ago, and he left me with these words, to never forget that Turkey is the capstone of the Middle East. It is a, a large part of Western countries sitting there at the top uh, of the Middle East. And, you know, this point about the economy, Tim, makes me feel that it cannot continue to be the capstone of the Middle East. Uh, it must have less um, influence all the time. Um, and that means influence to make peace, influence to do trade, to you know, avoid the incursion of its own borders. Um, there, there's a certain amount of chaos going on because Turkey is not the capstone anymore of the Middle East. Um, you know, and uh, let me let me tell you a short story and see if that fits in any way. When I first arrived in in Hawaii, I was in the Coast Guard, and one of the issues that crossed my desk was a um, a, a Turkish uh, naval ship uh, that had permission to tie up uh, on Battleship Row in Pearl Harbor, and they did. But um, shortly after they arrived here, um, the captain of the Turkish ship contacted uh, the Navy. And, and uh, asked if he could hang a man who had violated Turkish law. Um, and he, he wanted to know if it was okay to do that on Battleship Row in Pearl Harbor. And we collaborated in that decision. And the decision was, no, no, you can't hang a man from the yard arm on Battleship Row in Pearl Harbor. So um, the Turkish captain said, uh, okay, thank you very much. And in the morning, without hesitation, 
uh, the ship steamed out three miles outside of you know territorial waters, and they hung the man and came back all by nine o'clock in the morning. Um, now that tells you something. It tells you something about their willingness to adhere to our morality, um, to our conventions. It tells you something about Turkey. And don't forget, Tim, don't forget Midnight... Uh, Midnight Express? Midnight Express. What happened in that case? I mean, they got a problem with, with human rights and civil rights. And some of this is going to devolve uh, into you know, atrocities, I think, if it hasn't already. Where does it go from here? Well, let me just comment on, you know... What, what does every strong man have in common? What does every dictator have in common? How do they rise to power? It's usually over un, unchecked, uh, uncontrolled immigration. That the people are, you know, the people that live in that country, say, it's too much. We didn't ask for this. And now either our culture is being uh, usurped or economically we're being um, thrown into an adverse situation. That's how every autocrat gets his toehold foothold into the, the office of prime minister or president. Uh, in the case of Erdogan, I don't think he's any different in his hatred for the Kurds. And he's been able to, you know, uh, scapegoat them and castigate them as evil. Uh, that has a certain influence with human nature. Uh, I don't care if it's in Pol Pot's regime or Stalin's regime or in Rwanda, wherever there's hatred. Um, if you can get the people to get on board with that, that hatred and that emotion, uh, that puts you in power for quite some time, uh, just under that issue alone. So where, does we, where do we go from here with Erdogan? Well, my hope is that you know, he, become, he tries to become a better partner of the, the EU and, and NATO. And I don't know if that's too late for him to, to change at his, this point in time. Maybe the close election, uh, makes him see things in a different light. I don't know. Um, but he is a, a member of both the EU and NATO. And uh, it's my hope that, that um, he becomes a committed partner for that. You know, back years ago, Chuck, um, when he wanted to get into NATO for the reasons uh, that he had at the time, I guess it was him, um, he had trouble. He had to prove up to them that he was a, a worthy candidate and, uh, you know, it was such a go as to whether he could be a member of NATO. So here we are now. NATO has its own issues and the EU has its issues. And, um, you know, this discussion of all these points and problems that we're having today, they probably have in, in Germany um, and in other countries in the EU. And I wonder, A, what you think of their reaction to him. He's kind of, um, he's a renegade, is what he is. He hasn't been worthy of their confidence in making him a member. Um, and he's been stopping new memberships for bad reasons or no reasons. And he's an obvious uh, autocrat, which is not what they want in the EU. Um, and uh, I think, what's his name, Scholz in, in, um, you know, in Germany and, and, the, and the leader of the EU and NATO, those, those guys are probably pulling their hair out about Erdogan. So my question, we don't know for sure, but my question is, what do you think they think about Erdogan? And my second question is, what should they do about him? He's a problem. That's a great, very compound question. <clears throat> but if we break it down into <clears throat> where's the base and source of Erdogan's power within Turkey internally, <clears throat> primarily it's a very autocratic, supportive, reactionary faction <clears throat> that he has been able to get enough support from that he's got a comfortable coalition majority in parliament. Let's see where that goes over his five years as to whether he's able to establish and maintain control or not. Externally, internationally, probably his most important relationship is going to have to be with the EU, not just economically, but geopolitically as well. So those two, I think, are going to tell us a lot about whether Erdogan has any staying power and who's going to maneuver to take over after him and when that happens. What do they do about him? He's a troublemaker. But he's internally dependent on those factions. And so there are other groups that outsiders could go to 
to establish relationships that could undercut his internal power. So they have choices to withhold economic trade privileges, which they control to a much greater extent than Erdogan and Turkey do. And Tim, you have thoughts about this? Yeah, I just thought, his, you know, there's a boundary line. I mean, if you're going to be a member of the EU, there's an expectation of the EU for you to, to stay within certain boundary lines. And um, we have a case where England said, no, I'm, we're not going to go and re remain in these boundary lines. We're going to Brexit. And I'm not saying that's going to happen with Turkey, but if he continues on a path of human right abuses and anti-democratic tactics, um, nuzzling up to a force in power known as Russia, um, these are not good things for continued membership in the EU. But juxtaposed to that, we have President Biden, who's more than willing to sell them the F-16s that he wants. Uh, of course, they'll leverage and Sweden will get in as a um, NATO member. But, um, you know, all boundary lines have are just that. They're boundary lines. And we'll see how far he strays across them. Yeah, it's interesting that uh, Joe Biden doesn't see this as black and white at all. Not at all. And we talked uh, the other day about his um, deal on, on the debt ceiling and how he continues to operate um, in an, uh, a bilateral way, trying to find common ground. Uh, trying ultimately to make a deal. And I, and I feel the echoes of that discussion here today um, that, yeah, there, you know, there are outrageous things happening uh, in Turkey. Um, but uh, Joe Biden feels that he, he needs Turkey and Turkey needs him. So he's trying to find some kind of common denominator, uh, bipartisan deal to deal with Turkey. Um, the play of the odd couple comes to mind. <laughs> <laughs> So the other the other thing, uh, Chuck, is, you know, we, we could have a Republican president next time. And, and certainly we have a, a, a troubled Congress, may I say. Will Congress uh, support relations with, um, you know, Turkey or is wh where does it fall? Uh, is it they will will they treat it as part of Europe? Will they treat it as a, a Russian ally? Um, where where are the Republicans? Have they ever made a policy statement about how they feel Turkey should be treated? Well, I think, again, you can look at the factions. And within the Republican Party, one of the things that's happened in the debt ceiling slash budget negotiations is that Biden and McCarthy reached agreement not only on those measures, but on establishing coalitions and alliances of votes in the House and the Senate that would be able to get their agreement passed. And that's in the process of happening. And the MAGA Republicans have been powerless to stop that. In fact, some of the noisiest of them, Marjorie Taylor Greene and others, have supported the package because they're recognizing they can either come in and be part of the coalition or they can be on the outside with their little 25% group and the coalition will have a plan B, will have other choices about people to align with. And that may be bipartisan alignments that will get them more of what they want than they can get by acceding to the MAGA GOP demands. That's a very interesting parallel to draw, Chuck. I mean, we could be having, um, you know, the same kind of experience, the same kind of consideration, you know, as we discussed yesterday in connection with the debt ceiling. Wow. Very interesting. We, we, we seem to be developing, a, a, you know, a, a, an understanding of how Biden up. Chuck, can you go first and give us your your thoughts? You've been so thoughtful, as always. Uh, what are your thoughts? What what should people think about Turkey now after all the things we've considered? How careful should we be in paying attention to them? I think the best thing we can do is exactly what you just suggested. Pay attention. See what's happening, and not only internally with Turkey, with its economy, with its earthquake rebuilding and reconstruction, but externally, particularly with its EU relationship, with its US relationship, with the Russia relationship, because all of those things are gonna have to be orchestrated with a sufficient degree of harmony that they get major recovery infusion resources and opportunities. They are not able to be and stay on a plateau. 
They've got a very steep upward climb to go, and they need people externally and internally to support that and go along with that. Is that going to happen? We'll just have to watch and see. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How important, Tim, uh, your final comments, but how important is Turkey in this whole you know, global picture? Is it a player uh, or maybe a, a lesser player? Well, that's a tough question, but I, I guess I'll refer to your comment about um, the struggle for Turkey to become part of the EU and NATO. Uh, remember, they didn't really want Turkey in back then, back in those days. And I, I, I could see from a cultural as aspect, it doesn't really resemble anything in Europe. I mean, other than once you get outside of Istanbul, uh, the industrial city of Izmir, and of course the capital city of Ankara, um, it really is quite quite different culturally. So uh, it acts differently than your EU nations, and maybe that's part of the problem. It's a different culture, completely different culture. But remember, we've had a long association with Turkey as far as military cooperation. If you recall, during the uh, Cuba Missile Crisis, it was the missile that we took out of Turkey in order to settle that negotiation so that we didn't have worldwide annihilation. And Turkey's always allowed um, our, our flight, you know, the flight air zones for our, our jets to address issues in the Middle East and, um, you know, uh, safe harbor. So that relationship is critical and still very much needed. So I think these differences will be patched up. Uh, I don't think Erdogan's going anywhere anytime soon, and we're just going to have to live with it. On that note, Thank you very much, Tim Apicella, co-host, and Chuck Crumpton, esteemed guest. Thank you so much. Aloha. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.